Welcome to Public Health Matters, where we talk about matters in public health. My name is Jane Goodman, and I'm a communications specialist with the Division of Public Health and Community Services. This week, we continue looking at our social determinants of health. What helps us in our community be more healthy? And those kind of things that are so important are our children's programs. So I'm very pleased to have Megan Karen here. Welcome, Megan. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure um, to be here. Megan's from the Arlington Street Community Center. And so we're just really interested in, in knowing about Arlington Street and when it started and all of those things. So sure, take absolutely. it away. Yeah, uh, thank you again for having me. I'm, I'm excited for the opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, what we do at the center. Um, so we're actually fairly new. Um, I'll travel back a little bit. In uh, May of 2016, Mayor Donchus took the My Brother's Keeper Community uh, Challenge. Um, under the Obama administration. And so what that is, is uh, it's basically a national call to action to uh, for communities to kind of look at, you know, their respective communities and create robust plans and programming um, that really aim to, uh, or emphasizes, you know, that no matter, that all youth, no matter who they are, where they come from, you know, the circumstances that they were born into um, have the opportunity to succeed and reach their fullest potential. And um, so with a particular emphasis of, um, uh, with youth of color. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea is that when we break down some of these barriers um, that marginalized communities face, we help them, you know, define success as it is, as, it matters to them. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the first step in that challenge um, was for Mayor Donchus. He held a big community forum where over 70 community partners um, came together. And the one thing that they decided uh, was that there's no community space. We don't have a community mm -hmm. center. So in October of 2017, um, we opened the Arlington Street Community Center, which is at 36 Arlington Street. Uh, was uh, formerly a, a ballet studio and a fire station for several years, and it's actually right in front of uh, Dr. Crisp. Okay, and, and we could pop up a picture of that so people can see where it is. And great, I did drive by it. It is definitely an old fire station mm -hmm. first. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but there's a ton of history there, which mm -hmm. I personally love. Right. And it's a building that's useful in the community and you put it to good use. Absolutely. So you opened in two, um, 2017 mm -hmm. and have you been there since the opening? Or? I have not. So I actually came in December 2018. Okay. So um, before then it was really run from City Hall um, and by volunteers and it still is very much driven um, through volunteer work, so, which is, I think, really incredible. You know, we believe that community builds community. So we have all of these different partners um, coming together and offering programming and events for uh, youth and families. Um, so besides, I'm the full-time staff there, and then everyone else is a, is a volunteer. Mm -hmm. So a staff of one, but you're actually employed by the city. Yes, yes, I am. Um, and in terms of programming, uh, there were six uh, focus areas under the MBK Community Challenge, and so the city chose three. So the first one is um, access to early childhood education. Mm -hmm. The second is learning, uh, uh, I'm sorry, reading at grade level by grade three. Okay. And the third is reducing violence and providing second chances. So we really focus on the first two. It's I mean, it's the best fit for our building, mm -hmm. um, just in terms of layout per se. Um, so when we do program, um, we th we try to integrate that into our, our programs and events, mm -hmm. um, you know, knowing that offering these opportunities um, creates more equity for folks. And when we Absolutely. do that, we have a happier, healthier, more successful community. And I would imagine it would carry over into that third pillar of less violence in the community. If yeah, that naturally. Safe space and better, more literacy and mm -hmm. uh, preschool programs as well. Yes, actually, uh, that was one of the first initiatives that I um, kind of took on at the center. Um, as we know, preschool and any type of early childhood um, education is extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, some of the, you know, it seems like, at least my understanding and my experience has been that all of the um, early childhood uh, programs usually go to a wait list. So 
when we look at, you know, if you have student A and then you have student B, and student A had some type of pre-K exposure, uh, and student B had none, and you're putting them at kindergarten at the same time, what are we doing, you know, how are they going to succeed and at what level? And right. so even if it's, you know, so for us it was three hours a week of a pre-K activity group, even if we can provide that, that's at least three more hours that that child may have um, as opposed to none. Right. Some structured time. Yes. Some structured learning. Yep. Even if it's like play learning. Yeah, exactly. Which I think is, Yeah. So socialization, fine motor skills, um, and even just the routine of it helps that child transition into kindergarten. So, um, you know, knowing that we want to keep everything free, um, there every <clears throat> yeah every program that we offer is free. Um, I had the idea, I was actually online and something popped up, the uh, Revere Education Club. So it's mm -hmm. students at Revere who are studying to become teachers. So I reached out to them and asked them if they would be interested in running some type of pre-K activity group. Uh, and we partnered up and they have done an amazing job. You know, we weren't sure how it would go, um, but it's I've really been blown away with what they've been able to do. Um, so that's been really great to have them, uh, you know, both the the youngsters and the um, student teachers in there. Right, and it helps everyone because the students get experience. Exactly. And the kids get the benefit of really a trained uh, professional too mm -hmm. being in there. So that's just, uh, that's such a great um, partnership. I know you mentioned you're right across the street from Dr. Chris. Mm -hmm. So tell me about your partnership with um, the elementary school and what other partnerships you have in the community. Yeah, sure. So Dr. Chris is obviously one of our closest and strongest partners. Um, we, you know, work very closely with the teachers and I myself work personally uh, very closely with the homeschool uh, coordinator, the Title I homeschool coordinator, Grace Forrest. Um, and she's been a very strong volunteer in all regards and all programming. Um, I think with that, it's really important, at least in my experience in any community level, you know, community based work to build trust in the community. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, uh, from Nashua originally, but coming back to Nashua, you know, I don't know these youth and families. I don't know what they're going through. Um, so Dr. Crisp and Grace especially has been really helpful in, in me building trust with some of the community members, mm -hmm. um, and trying to meet their needs. Um, I'll give you an example. So uh, we offer, you know, pre-COVID, we offered um, skill building. Uh, so that's kids kindergarten and first and some second graders who have been identified by their teachers um, who need a little extra help um, in, in reading and writing and, and math. Mm -hmm. So um, those kids go through a referral process with a group of retired teachers um, and they come on twice a week to receive some extra help. Um, so you know, it's been, it's also, I mean, we were having, I believe a 100% success rate um, in terms of, you know, um, the volunteers who would test the, the students mm -hmm. before, during and after. Right. So again, just a couple of hours a week trying to provide those, you know, small opportunities to make a big difference. But that one-on-one -on -one help Yes. So beneficial. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you have retired teachers doing that because they have so much to offer. Yes. And it gives them, you know, some structure to their day too. But yeah. also, um, it just, it's such a great community effort, which I'm hearing more and more, which I just love to hear because the only way in public health that we get anything done is to partner. Right. So um, have you partnered with any other agencies? I did see something about the soup kitchen possibly or yes. some other. Yes, so um, again, pre-COVID, we were working with um, the soup kitchen, uh, Corpus Christi and Salvation Army to offer food to our um, most vulnerable families. Um, I think the number I last looked at was 98% from Dr. Crisp. Um, so the way it would work is Corpus Christi and Salvation Army would switch off weeks with non-perishables um, and the National Soup Kitchen would bring fresh produce um, each week. So it's um, basically kind of another hub that's a little closer to um, you know, Crown Hill families. Right, to that neighborhood. Do you have mm -hmm. to be in Crown Hill to access the center or can you come? Oh no, anyone. From across know. the city? I yep. Mean, not like it's right. New York yeah. City or anything. <laughs> yeah. But. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that is something that the city looked at initially. You know, you have the Boys and Girls Club and then, you know, um, a, a little further down, you have um, 
the well, there's PAL. PAL, right. But on uh, this side of Main Street, there's really nothing for the community. So that that was uh, actually a, a big factor in choosing the location as well. Yeah, so it fills a little void for that area. Mm -hmm. Big void, it sounds like. Yeah, and it's really been, you know, great to see over the last two years that I've been here, the recurrence of families and seeing the same kids, um, you know, that trust and just that spreading the word takes time. Uh, but we have less folks coming in uh, saying, you know, oh, this is, I've never heard of this. So mm -hmm. slowly but surely we're, we're building that the there. Out. And then yeah. COVID happens right. and you have to close your doors. Yes. How did you pivot? How, what did you do to keep in touch with your families? Um, Cause that's, you know, that's gotta be a little bit frustrating cause you're building your relationships and then all of a sudden you don't have that face to face. Sure. So. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, it was more, it was just a real bummer, you know. Um, <laughs> that's a, that's yeah, a good way to describe yeah. this. A real, <laughs> right, just a real. It is a real a, bummer. A bummer. Um, so I wasn't necessarily frustrated, just kind of feeling helpless in terms of what can we offer these families that, you know, everyone's, you know, very much in, in crisis mode. There's so much, especially, well, at that time that was unknown, um, you know, how long will we be in remote learning? Um, but by the time May rolled around, we were looking at, okay, how can we open? Can, you know, can we open? How can we do this safely? And, um, you know, we decided that even just the pure layout of the building, it's not safe to have community members in there. But what we can do is we can program virtually and we can offer some type of to-go activity. So, um, you know, youth and families can come up to the window on this day of the week and get that activity of, of the week. So um, we did this through, you know, a couple couple of avenues. We were able to secure some um, pretty high-tech uh, technology. Uh, it took a couple of weeks for me to really get familiar with it, but it's a Zoom Room mobile kit um, in our dance nice. studio. Yeah, so it's basically a, a Zoom computer um, with a camera and a microphone and a virtual whiteboard um, to to host meetings. So that's how we do all of our dance classes. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, we were able to uh, figure out certain days of the week and certain programs um, to do those to, to go kits. And honestly, you know, you're trying to program and you're trying to figure out how can we best meet community needs and what necessarily are they. Um, so we were really curious as to what the response would be, uh, but it's been really, really great, especially with the to go kits. Um, the feedback that we've that we've received has been really um, amazing. So that, you know, that's something we're going to continue throughout the fall. Yeah, I noticed I could pick up a pumpkin. Yes. For Halloween. Yep. So, uh, <laughs> you know, end. our um, Halloween party is um, our, our biggest uh, event, uh, one of the biggest events. It's tied with the tree giveaway of the year, but it's a really special one because that was our first um, community event. And obviously it's not quite the same this year, but we're going to be doing, um, you know, that grab and go style. So you can pull in um, or, you know, walk up, you can wear your, still wear your costume, you can pick out a pumpkin, you'll grab a bag of, you know, goodies and um, a decorating kit. And, um, you know, that's that, that to go. So that's how we, we pivot this year. So right. we're just doing some slight adjustments. Yeah, so you have to really get creative. Yes, but that's, you know. But uh, that's can, what you do anyway, right? Right, exactly. And and that's the thing. This is the, the community need, uh, need. How can we meet that in the most effective way possible? Have you gotten any additional people to come into your Zoom room for dance classes because it is virtual now, so maybe you could even get more people from across from right. across town. Yeah, which is great. Um, and we've also had a couple of um, a couple of folks from surrounding towns, which is which is you know great. I think the more that we can program to communities beyond is is great. We actually had a few kids from North Carolina um, and they, you know, it was for our uh, dance camp. We did a prince and princess dance camp for um, youth three to five. Um, and they, beforehand, parents would come in and get their little kits because you could do activities at the end. And um, they said, oh, you know, we won't have a kit because we're in North Carolina. Um, but it just goes to show, I mean, I think in a way, in terms of spreading the word and, and what we do, that's a really great opportunity for us as well. Um, and I also think that, you know, as, as much as we try to consider Zoom fatigue, um, even, you know, lack of transportation or if you have parents who are working. It gives this, people greater access. Yeah, exactly. So I think that, you know, with every 
um, with every down, there's there's also an opportunity to kind of rise up and meet those needs. Right. And are the families, do they have access to technology? I know this has been a big discussion in the school districts and, mm -hmm. and in my own town, you know, whether or not kids have the adequate um, ability to even watch a Zoom class. Yeah. So how have you addressed that? So we haven't necessarily seen any difficulties with that. Um, the one thing that we were considering, um, we are partnering with the UNH Extension Program to offer a STEM workshop, and we've done that in the past. We did a STEM um, uh, mini camp over the summer last year and a vacation series as well. Um, but they did offer um, and, you know, wanted to consider, um, you know, are we going to be or are these kids signing up going to be facing any issues in terms of accessing the class? We don't want that to be a barrier. Um, we could, you know, purchase hotspots if those are available. Mm -hmm. So I think that's another example of how, you know, several community entities can come together and, and try to meet these needs and figure out, you know, any difficulties or any barriers mm -hmm. uh, and break those down so that everyone's getting the op same opportunity. And we had the opportunity to have um, Mike Apfelberg on from the United Way, and they've learned United, so that might be a resource. Yes, absolutely. Um, they have hot spots available. Yep. So, um, and, yeah, and we've. Um, <laughs> if you need them. Yeah, no, that's great. <laughs> and we've actually sent a few of our uh, skill building volunteers um, towards, you know, that way, just because we won't be tutoring um, this, this fall or, you know, we'll see about the spring. Um, but for those individuals who still wanted to volunteer and, and tutor youth, um, we've sent them towards the United Way to try to get involved with their effort um, that they're working on right now. So I think it's also a great, a great way to kind of come together. And if we can't meet that need or e even, you know, to point um, a potential volunteer in the right mm -hmm. direction, um, you know, that's, that's a great thing about it. Yeah, it sounds amazing, really. It's um, congratulations, really, on getting this started and to keep it going during COVID and to be creative. I, I love the to-go kits yeah, um, and to have that for the community. It's just so important and it gives a, the kids a little something to look forward to as right. well, which I think is important since they're spending some time at home these days. Yes, definitely, and especially during the summer, too, as parents were going back to work and um, kids were, you know, um, spending more time at home than they usually would um, you know even if it's it's something once a week that we can provide we're happy and, and willing to do it yeah so what does um, is there an age limit for your center uh, no not necessarily so there are a couple classes that are more geared towards adults so uh, ballet for example our ballet class um, is 16 plus mm -hmm. um, our, our yoga classes is, is geared towards teens and adults as well um, other than that you know depending on the program Yes, um, we. I would say we see more programs for um, ten under, twelve under. Um, but yeah, depending on the program, is uh, it's geared towards each age group. Um, we would love to incorporate um, older, middle, and high schoolers into mm -hmm. some programming um, in the future. We did. Um, we had UNH Extension run some um, vacation camps that were geared towards high schoolers. They did an electronics um, STEM um, mini camp. So that was, um, you know, that was that introduction and we did see some success with that. So moving forward as we're going virtual and we're doing these to go kits, we would really um, love and are considering, you know, trying to um, offer more to middle and high schoolers. Mm -hmm. So while you're virtual, um, are you doing things to get the center kind of ready to reopen? Do you, you know, they talk about airflow and these right. kind of things. We talk about that in our office all yes. the time. And you said the building's really not appropriate right now mm -hmm. for that. So are there things you're doing or help that you need, like improving that? Well, like we talked about, it's an old fire station, old, old. Um, so airflow is not the best. Um, and I think, too, just... Um, I am, I'm, so I'm the staff member. Yes. So, <laughs> so as I, and I am, I happily clean and, and do everything on that, um, you know, it's all the janitorial <laughs> duties. But the more people that we have in the building is the more we have to really consider. And so to do that safely, you know, the risk is just too high right now. We'll see what it looks like in the future. Um, but even, the, the layout of the building, you know, um, in conjunction with the airflow, the there's no really set entrance and exit. 
So we could have folks crossing paths, um, you know, un unknowingly or mistakenly. So that's mm. something that, you that's know. to really be thought through. Yeah. Excuse me, one second. <coughs> mm. Little tickle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's have a crystal ball. Summer comes. We have some kind of summer camp if, if hopefully. Yeah. So actually we did our first summer camp, <coughs> our summer day camp last, um, last summer. Um, and excuse me, with the help of volunteers and some of our high school interns from Nashua South, um, we offered um, camp Tuesdays and Thursdays from one to four. And so there was a couple different elements. So they would come in and, and they would usually be on a team that would travel from uh, classroom to classroom and, and outside. Um, one side would be some arts and crafts. The other side would be some type of STEM experiment activity, and then they would spend some time outdoors. So we would love to do that again. Um, and you didn't do any of that this summer? No, no that okay. yeah, so that's, we were trying to take, and I think we did so fairly successfully, those STEM activities that we would mm -hmm. usually do in the classroom and, and build little kits mm -hmm. um, and just made sure that every everything that they would need in a kit was in there. Even if it was, I, I ordered a lot of food coloring for, um, I think there were uh, lava lamps, but oh, they all got oh, their fun. own. Yeah, yeah, make your own lava lamps. <laughs> it's like really cool. That. Yeah, <laughs> it, the, the fun part is that I always do the activity first to make sure that, you know, I'm not sending anything home uh, that would give parents or guardians a, yeah. a headache. So that and was as a cool. parent, I appreciate that because <laughs> yeah. it can tell you that there are some things that just don't work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, but that, you know, that's a little, a, a, a plus is to be able to to yeah. do these activities. Yeah, so that's great. Yeah. Well, best of luck to you. Thank you as so much. You move forward, and um, if people want more information, can is there a phone number they can call or a website yeah. they can access? We actually have a, a shout. Yeah, we have a brand new website. It's uh, www.asccnashua.com. Um, and so that's where all the latest news, um, the calendar, um, there's even a section to make donations. Everything that we receive um, in donations goes directly back into programming. Um, so, but that's that's really our, our information hub. So ASCC.com. ASCCNashua.com. Oh, ASCCNashua.com. We yes. want to get that right for yes. you. <laughs> Thank you. We want to drive that. some more business your way um, <laughs> because I, it's just such a great effort in the community. And I, you know, again, as public health people, we love to hear about um, the collaboration and, you know, working with the food pantries around the city, working with the retired teachers, yeah. having interns from Nashua South and Riviera College, I mean, Riviera University. Right. <laughs> um, it's just amazing. And that just builds our community stronger and keeps us more healthy. So thank you for all you do yeah. and thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. It was, it was my pleasure. So we'll be back in a minute. And um, just want to remind you, if you are in need of a COVID test, we do have a clinic every Tuesday from 3 to 5 in the Elm Street parking garage. You can make a reservation online now if you visit the City of Nashua Division of Public Health and Community Services, or you can call our COVID hotline at 589-3456. The use of face masks in public may reduce the spread of infection in the community. Everyone can help prevent the spread of respiratory droplets even when not feeling sick. Face masks or cloth coverings can be handmade or purchased. Medical face masks should be saved and used by healthcare professionals. Wearing a face mask will help protect people around you, including those at higher risk of severe illness from COVID-19 and workers who come in close contact with other people. Wear a face mask in the community when visiting indoor, crowded, or busy places. Face masks should be worn along with physical distancing, covering a cough or sneeze, washing hands, and avoiding touching your nose, mouth, and eyes with unwashed hands. Using face masks in a safe way is important. Face masks should cover your face from the top of the nose down to your chin. Clean hands with soap and water or sanitizer before and after touching your mask. Remove the mask from the ear loop. Do not touch the front of the mask. If disposable, throw away in an appropriate container. If reusable, wash often with hot water and regular detergent. Encourage others to participate and practice safe and healthy behavior.
Thank you, Greater Nashua, for helping to slow the spread. Welcome back to Public Health Matters, where we talk about matters in public health. I'm joined now by Sharon McCarthy, who is our CEO of Girls Inc. of Nashua and also an office in Manchester, from what I understand. Um, we're continuing our topics based on programs for kids. Let's keep our community healthy um, and strong by reaching out to those in our community that really need um, some socialization, some programming. I was reading Bold, Be Bold. What? Strong, <laughs> strong, strong, Smart, and Bold strong, is smart, our mission. Strong, Smart, and Bold is yeah. the mission of Girls Inc., which I love. I Because I just too. think it's like strong, you know, it's just, it, it's great. It's three great words. It, it is, and it so, really fits. Yeah, so tell me about Girls Inc., when it started, and what, beyond um, Strong, Smart, and Bold. Yeah, well, it started, as far as here in New Hampshire, um, Girls Inc. came into play in 1974. It was the Girls Club back then. Um, I think it was 1990 that it became Girls Inc. And Girls Inc. is a national organization. Mm -hmm. So we're an affiliate of that. Okay. So we operate independently here in New Hampshire. And we're one of 85 affiliates around the country. Okay. So um, the Strong, Smart, and Bold is uh, the mission of the whole organization mm -hmm. to inspire all girls to be strong, smart, and bold. Um, and it so fits what we do because we offer, you know, physical programs. We offer, um, you know, empowerment and um, programming mm -hmm. on the smart piece of it. And the bold piece, we just really encourage each girl to recognize their own personal strengths and really try to work with them one-on-one -on -one so mm -hmm. we can really help them in their futures. Wow. So t let's go back to the old days, typical. Um, what were some of the services that you provide um, to girls, and how do they access it? Like, do they come after? Were they coming after school, before sure. school? You know, tell yeah, us about yeah. There your, is the before and after. Yeah, we'll talk about of, after, but yeah, let's talk about yeah. before because we're going to get back to before someday. So yeah. let's talk about before. Right, well, we're inching closer to that. <laughs> yeah, we are. But um, typically, um, girls would uh, we would pick them up at school with our girls girls link buses and take them back to our centers, and we do have the center in Nashua on Burke Street and one on in the west side in Manchester. So we'll pick the girls up, we'll bring them to the centers after school and run programming um, from when they get there until they leave at five or six o'clock. Mm -hmm. And then we do um, a young woman's leadership program. We do summer camp um, that we did a version of it this summer, but typically we have literally hundreds of girls um, with us all summer long. And then we run programming in schools all around the mm -hmm. state. So um, we'll go into a school in, say, like Rochester, New Hampshire, and um, girls will sign up for our program, and we'll deliver a program that's all research-based, Girls, Inc. national-provided um, kinds of programming that could be on anything from technology to health and wellness to um, prevention-type programs um, to leadership programs and so many other things in between. Wow. So... Very interesting that you have this Nashua, but this Nashua, um, I, I want to say branch, it's not the Y, but I mean the well, Nashua. Yeah, yeah, center for our Nashua Yeah, your Nashua yeah. center, but you also are willing to travel um, and, get, and do programming in other towns across we do. the state. Part of the mission is to reach as many girls as possible mm -hmm. that could benefit from our services. So um, they can come to us, we can go to them. Um, or they can um, just, you know, experiment with different programs that we do. And, um, you know, the goal is to try and attract the girls who need us most. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some families absolutely need to work. So instead of girls going home alone after school or they have this real sense of community at Girls Inc. in our centers. And it's a girl only environment. So it's safe. It's non-threatening. Mm -hmm. They have... Um, it's very non-judgmental, believe mm -hmm. it or not. Even with middle school ages, each aged girls, there's um, a tremendous amount of support for each other. When you're teaching them that too, you're fostering that community. We are, and we we are. It's a it's a real emphasis, and they build relationships with our staff that really are meaningful to them and their families. We have we have uh, there's a lot of single moms mm -hmm. in in our program, for example, or grandmothers or relatives that are bringing up kids, and we're like an extended family to them. Absolutely. And they 
express that to us and it's incredibly meaningful. Do you do any programming for the parents or is that, um, we, I mean, if there's in, time? Informally, or... but that's something that we'd like to do more of is offer maybe some parenting type classes or um, offer some programming in our, in our centers. Um, we do um, a mentoring program mm -hmm. that um, isn't geared for the parents, but it gives the girls access to a different person in mm -hmm. a, like it, it might be a, a female executive that would come in uh, after, after the courses are done in the mm -hmm. afternoon and spend time with a group of four or five girls that the same girls meet with the same mentor over an eight week period. And they might just talk, they might do a craft, they might go do something, mm -hmm. they play games and it just, again, just builds trust and other relationships and modeling and mm -hmm. um, so the whole the whole goal is to help a lot of these girls see a brighter future mm -hmm. be able to sort of step out of the situation they might be in now mm -hmm. and recognize that there's a whole lot of opportunity out there yeah sounds fantastic it's incredibly <laughs> rewarding yeah it, <laughs> it sounds is. great tell me um how many girls did you have, just give me a, a snapshot, last year going yeah. through your program? Uh, we had close to 2,000 girls. Wow, um, and just Nashua? All, uh, no, no, all oh, in. Okay, That's how about just Nashua? Just Nashua, about 100 girls okay. at, a, at a clip for the after school program. Okay. And then um, at, at like another 100 girls in the summer camps. And then, um, you know, a different set of girls that we would reach, of course, through the schools around the state. Okay. So, but still 2,000, it's fairly impressive yeah, for a Manchester. small organization to... When you add it all up, um, <laughs> we do, we have a lot of data we need to collect mm -hmm. as being part of a national affiliate, so... Um, we love data in public oh, health. I, we want to know who you're, <laughs> who you're reaching and, you know, are you reaching those vulnerable communities? Right. Because right. that's very important. Yes. You know, give s some of these girls a leg up because um, they are coming, as you said, from some difficult situations. Indeed. And how do you, how do, you do that outreach? Who do you, is there other people that you get referrals from or schools or how does this work? The outreach into the schools? Yeah, well, how do you get, how do the girls find out about it? Uh, usually through the schools and mm -hmm. through our, you know, we, we can we can't like promote and talk to girls individually in the mm -hmm. schools, but we'll meet with um, you know a, the programming person within the school system, mm -hmm. um, talk to them about what we're doing, describe the program, make sure they're well versed in what Girls Inc offers, and then they'll put it out there to the girls to sign up. And it's usually you get five or six girls that are interested, mm -hmm. then they get their friends and bring them in, and then it becomes a you know, we've got groups of like 30 girls um, at a couple schools in Manchester. We have 70 or 80 girls mm -hmm. um, that will come in. And it, it varies depending right. where we are. If it's a tiny school, um, there might it's be a lot of word of mouth. Yes. Once someone tries it, they like it and they tell their friends. And... Yes. And then parents start talking to other parents and it sort of builds yeah. from there. That's great. Um, so you, you said you ran summer camp. Well, let's talk about COVID. Because we have to. It's the elephant in the room. It's not really even an elephant anymore. Yeah, but <laughs> it's just there. It's just there, but it yeah. does kind of hang over us, and does. we have to adjust. Um, one thing I was very impressed with is how you adjusted your spring fundraiser. Uh, on Thank like, you. Yeah. Turned on a dime to get that out there, and um, still. That, and it was shortly after I started days. as yeah. CEO. <laughs> Fortunately, uh, my past career in, in publishing and events, so that was probably the part that seemed most natural to me. So mm -hmm. that was a blessing. But um, the fortunate part for us is we had most of the sponsorships sold in advance, thinking it was not knowing this was going to happen Absolutely. and thinking it was going to be a live event. So we were in, in very good shape there. But the ticket sales are, you know, we have people buying tickets to sit at a table and network with people and experience the whole thing. Um, and every single person who had bought a ticket, we contacted and they decided to not ask for a refund and for allowed us to take it as a donation mm -hmm. and um that was amazing so the show went on it did yeah. and we had two weeks to turn it into a virtual event and um, we work worked with events um, unlimited in um, in londonderry and this was new to them too everybody was just right. trying to figure things out and they did a fabulous job and we had an auctioneer who really had some fun doing it mm -hmm on a live stage and we figured out the technology and um, we ended up just 
doing great with it. Yeah. It was it was thrilling. It's, actually, it's great and it's a relief too oh. because you know we a lot of nonprofits <laughs> really count on. Um, these big signature events. Yeah, that's um, $175,000 yes. for us. It's significant. It's our largest fundraiser, and uh, people bid high on the auction items. And, you know, the trick is going to be it, spring is coming right up. It will have to be virtual again. Right. And, uh, you know, we need an edge. You know, we kind of need to keep it exciting right. because, you know, everyone's sort of been doing the virtual events because we all have to. So I think the trick's going to be keeping it exciting and worth watching, and so we're starting to work on that. So, so that you did that very piece, well. Yeah. What did you do with your programs? How did you uh, get them? Did you get them online? You said you were in your did. summer camp. We, we, it, we did a combination of everything. So we follow the school systems in mm -hmm. both Nashua and Manchester. So we did have to. We did close for a few weeks, and we opened back up um, in June for summer camp. But before we did that, we did virtual programming. Okay. Um, we did uh, virtual young women's leadership. We did uh, mentoring um, virtual, and um, you know it was all figuring it out as we as we went. And uh, we're much better at it now than we 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 were as at that we time. all are. We all yeah. can use Zoom now. Oh, Zoom! <laughs> oh, we're all experts. Yeah. Yes, and uh, and so are the kids. Uh, so you know the girls pick up on that pretty quickly. Right. But there was some fatigue. You know, with, with using um, the computer all day and then, you know, again, with some of our programs. So um, so we, we didn't have as many girls participating in that as we would have in the centers. So to me, that's, that's been the biggest, um, the biggest drag in all of this is that even now we're open but mm -hmm. at half capacity. Mm -hmm. So the fact that half of those girls aren't being served by us is... Um, it makes me sad. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm anxious for that yeah. to come back. But we did virtual programming. We provided families with pantry items. We provided families with meals. Um, we tried to be there to talk with parents and kids if they just needed to talk because it was very isolating. And um, and we opened in June for summer camp at half capacity, both in Nashua and Manchester. And um, but it was different. We usually go to the pool. The pools weren't open. The pools were closed. We usually Nashua, take yeah. great field trips, and we couldn't do that. And we usually bring in, you know, entertainment and different um, presentations. So that was limited. But we made the best of it, and um, and had fun, and uh, you know, had a lot of girls benefit from the program, even though it was smaller. Mm -hmm. Did you do full day, or did you? We did. Yeah. Well, yeah, we you. did full day, but at half capacity. Yeah. So, and it was a little tricky, um, and it still remains tricky. A big challenge is hiring, you know, hiring qualified people. We like to hire people that have experience dealing with, with kids, mm -hmm. that love dealing with girls in our age groups, which is 5 to 18, and um, that are okay being in a setting with people like mm -hmm. that. So um, it's an in-demand kind of position. So... Um, that's been a little bit of a struggle. We'd actually have more girls in Nashua if we had more so staffing. More staff. Yes. Wow. Yeah. So um, if you're yeah, interested, there's yes. a place you can apply. Yes. Um, if uh, if even child, on a part-time basis, yeah. where we are and always have been really flexible. If we've got a great person who wants to do this, um, you know, we'll try to do a job share with somebody else so we can cover things. And it's a it's a very motivating place to mm -hmm. work. We have a lot of uh, our, our management has been there a long time and knows the drill. And it's a I, I don't know if you've seen Nashua, but it's a beautiful facility. Mm -hmm. we have a full I have gym. not seen it myself. It's it was uh, completely remodeled two years ago. So it's um, it's state of the art, mm -hmm. um, a beautiful gym that we um, use for the girls and also rent out for basketball teams and mm -hmm. church services and baton twirling and some <laughs> other things. And um we have a commercial kitchen in there, so nice. we do some catering for other daycares. And and I read that you feed the girls at we night. We do. I mean, um, on, 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 under normal circumstances. Always. We or do. always, even always. now, yep. so they can get meals there. Yes. So Are they to-go meals now? Or? Um, yes, they take dinner with them. And um, I'm really excited about what we're doing right now. We're doing something called the Smart Cafe. Okay. And so girls will get dropped off at like 7 or 7.30 a.m., and, and do their remote school day with us. Oh, so okay. it's supervised remote learning um, because it's it's really challenging. It you know, absolutely is. Very few is. kids are wired in a way that 
They enjoy sitting at a computer and doing everything virtually. Um, so there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of, you know, easily getting distracted. And so we have a team that helps them stay focused and doing what they need to do. And um, But honestly, seeing, you know, the five and six-year-olds working on a computer all day, you just kind of... I know. It's it, not easy. It's an adjustment for everyone. It is. But they must get some breaks during the they day. Do. And that's nicer. Can they run around in the gym? Are you uh, allowing after, that? After school, yes. Okay. Yep, if they have a little break. <laughs> Um, we, they certainly are allowed to have some so, some social activity, um, which I think is key because, mm -hmm. like I mentioned earlier, it's a very isolating experience. So, um, so they have uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner with us. They have wow. snacks, um, and when their school day is done, they are you know they're out on the playground or they're in the gym, or um, just having some fun with their with their schoolmates. So how many bold girls do you have right now in the program? Um, Nashua has, we, we've been averaging like 45 girls okay. a day. That's a, that's it, a fair it's amount. Yeah, we should keep everyone six feet apart. They, you know, everyone's temperature's taken when they come in and over the summer and up until now, we've been, been good. good. <laughs> yeah, and you're not... tracking that. Are there any spaces available if people are in need? If there are any girls out there that really could use some kind of structured program during the day. We, we have a few openings right now in Nashua. Um, it, it's fairly limited. We, we'd have to, we have to cap it at 50 okay. um, per you know, CDC and just trying of to course. be at the half capacity. Um, but as things change and if Nashua goes to a sort of a hybrid model, we might have some days or half days open. Up. Okay. And because um, that's happening in Manchester right now, they're phasing into a hybrid. So, um, you know, some girls will only be coming Monday and Wednesday. Right. And so, so it opens up some. Wow, slots. there's a lot of moving parts here, Sharon. It's tricky. <laughs> it's tricky scheduling. <laughs> and then keeping everyone's schedule straight because everyone's yeah. going to be going on different days probably. Yes. Do you have a full range of students that are coming in, full range of age that are coming in right now? Full range of ages. Uh, Nashua has a preschool as well. Mm -hmm. So we, we have girls from four to um, probably 13, 14. Some of the older girls are choosing to study from home. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it's, there's a lot of different things that happen in those age groups between four and, and teenager. So um, it, it represents all girls. And I think we have eight schools represented just in Nashua. So if you can imagine being a facilitator and there's different start times and different Absolutely. softwares <laughs> and different ways of communicating with the teacher and it keeps us on our toes. Yes, I, yeah. I would imagine it does. It's a, it's, we're it's all a on our toes time. right now. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Um, so tell me, what are your greatest needs right now? Um, I, I would say you know, ongoing funding. I mean, we have uh, the staff and the facilities and the, the operating expenses, of course. But um, you know, to keep offering programs that are um, you know state of the art and um, technology that goes with it. Um, I would almost isolate technology as its own need. We did have a group of people um, donate towards us buying Chromebooks mm -hmm. because some of the girls that come in, um, they don't, either their school Chromebook might not be working or they don't have a Chromebook. So we've been trying to provide technology to them. So um, funding, technology, staffing, I would say are our top three things right now. So I know that you have a raffle going on. I'll give we you a do. moment to do a little plug. Yay. That you can win a pretty spiffy red car. We can put it, the slide up and people can see. Okay. Um, so Good. $100 a ticket. $100 you can win. A what ticket. was that? It's a Mini Cooper? It's a Mini. It's a chili red chili two door red. hardtop Mini Cooper. So okay. we felt like that little car <laughs> so matched up with our strong, smart, and bold mm -hmm. mission. And, um, and they were very agreeable to work with us. They've you know, been helping us promote the contest. So it's, we're selling 1,000 tickets at $100. Wow, it's so a lot of tickets. It's, it's, but it, compared, like the, compared to like a lottery or something, it's a really <laughs> very good chance of, of winning something. There's three prizes. The car or $20,000 in cash is, will be the top prize. And then um, a Honda Scout, which is sort of a, um, a Motor, a motor scooter type of yeah. vehicle that's red and white. A also. cute little motorcycle. It's so cute. They'll see that too. Yep. That would be our second prize. And then um, the Series 6 Apple Watch would be the third prize. Which is also a great prize. I, yes. I mean, it can pretty yeah. much do anything for it you. Does. It can drive the car for you. Yeah. <laughs> just, I have to say, that's probably the prize <laughs> I would want to Yeah. <laughs> because I, it's just really, I didn't realize that I would like that so much. But uh, yeah. um, 
Are you wearing one? <laughs> yes. Uh, that's, <laughs> so. I don't have one yet, but I, when, when we were looking at this, I can't. <laughs> oh, you Darn can't. It, I can't. That's but right. But I can ask that's for true. it for Christmas. So um, if you want to buy a raffle ticket, you go onto your website yes, and you can navigate buy it right on the website. There. And then you'll be emailed your ticket receipt, and then we'll we're doing a physical drawing at Mini of Bedford on November thirtieth. Okay. So and this replaces what was a live event. So mm -hmm. it was another uh, way to do something that we think could raise um, the same amount of funds, and um, it it. it is safer, mm -hmm. basically, than trying to put on any kind of a, of a live event, even if it's socially distanced. Right. It's usually our woman of achievement that happens at the okay. end of October. So um, this is replacing that. It's off to a really good start. Mm -hmm. So um, we're promoting it heavily and fingers crossed that it's successful. Yeah, I feel like hosting this show, I go broke because everyone tells I'm... me about their initiatives <laughs> and then I feel like I have to go and <laughs> buy a ticket or, <laughs> you know, sponsor the sculpture or those kind of things. I so, can but, so relate. You know. Everyone I'm telling, they're like, well, we're doing something too. So I'll buy their ticket. They'll buy yeah. my ticket. I'm in the same boat. Yes. And, um, but that's not a bad thing either. If everyone's kind of doing their part and I... Right. If we support each other's organizations, it's really, yeah. it's essential. We've got to lift up everyone during this time because... This is going to go on for a little bit. Yeah. And so the more we can do to help each other, I think um, it I feel strengthens like we're our seeing community. That. I feel like the people who can give are giving right now. Mm -hmm. And that's really encouraging. Uh, you know, I, I, I think even like a year out from now is when we're really going to see how things are, when everything kind of shakes out. And um, that, that frankly makes me a little more nervous than, than right, know, now. right now. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. and um, you know there have been some nice opportunities available for nonprofits um, that have helped us get through this time. So um, we're just trying to be strong, yes. smart, and bold absolutely. With we're doing. Absolutely, you're walking the walk. Yeah, indeed. Uh, and talking the talk. Yes. Um, so you're moving your offices to Manchester. Is that right? Well, we have a, a administrative office administrative, in, in yeah. Manchester, and we're moving to a location on South Willow Street. Okay. So um, there's only a handful of us in that office, but um, I like having it in the center of the state because we serve the whole state right. in many ways. And um, so, yeah, that'll be coming up the end of the month. And uh, so we're gonna be right between the 99 and Barnes and Noble. So we'll have a little sign out there that I'm kind of excited about. Yeah. Pretty good traffic count on South Willow Street. So um, the more exposure Girls Inc. gets, the the easier it is to do what we do. Right. And right. you know, some people ask us like, what do you what do you do at Girls Inc. Yeah. again? Because um, you know, sometimes it, it requires some explanation. And I, mm -hmm. I one of my goals is to get the organization to the point where people just know what people we know. do. That we um, that you know we're like leaders in working with girls on their individual strengths and and offering programming that really helps them with life skills and um, you know, making good decisions and being the best person they can be. Yeah. Well, it sounds great. And thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. And telling us about Girls Inc. Uh, if people want raffle tickets, you can go on the Girls Inc. website. Yes. Um, no till November 30th. We're selling them t up, right up to that day. Right up, yes. of course. Because yeah. why not? Yeah. And <laughs> well, save us some stress and buy it now. Right. <laughs> exactly. Plan ahead, people. Uh, mm -hmm. But thank you so much for being thank here. You. And I wish you so much luck. And I hope that um, things will open up so that you can offer these services to more girls because it's That's just so thing. essential in our community. Again, strong kids, strong women. Yes. Um, it bolsters our community. It improves the public health in our community. And so we appreciate everything you do uh, you. for the city of Nashua and, of course, Manchester, too. But uh, here we are in Nashua. Yeah, so, and no, greater and, and Nashua. We've been in Nashua longer than anywhere. So, yeah. so um, just really great programming. And um, thank you. Thank you very much. And again, thank you all for joining us for this public health hour. Again, if you are in need of a COVID test, please call the COVID hotline, 589-3456. And you can schedule your own appointment online at the National Division of Public Health and Community Services. Our clinics take place on Tuesdays from 3 to 5 p.m. at the Elm Street Parking Garage. You can drive through, it's very easy. Um, Hope you all have a great week.